I was expecting a lot. <laughs> My mother would be very unimpressed with that introduction. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Do it again. <laughs> Adrian, you don't want to be in here because you've heard all of these jokes before. So, uh, my name's Andrew Hay. Uh, I am the CISO at Data Gravity, based out of Nashua, New Hampshire. I get to work in San Francisco and live in San Francisco uh, because I wasn't going to move to Nashua, New Hampshire. So, a uh, little bit about me. Whoa. Uh, so, Andrew Hay. Before this job at Data Gravity, I and I've only been there since January. Uh, I was the director of research at OpenDNS, now Cisco. Not my fault, I swear. Uh, chief evangelist at Cloud Passage. They're still Cloud Passage. And I was an industry, a dirty, dirty industry analyst for 451 Research for, I think, three years. Uh, I've also worked in the trenches as a practitioner for uh, a university in Western Canada, which was interesting. Uh, and a bank in Bermuda, and I actually did live and work in Bermuda, which sounds a lot cooler than it actually was. I was also, I think, employee 34 or something at Q1 Labs, which was acquired by IBM, and all my friends are rich. I am not. Uh, I've also written four books now uh, that, judging by my statements, none of you have read, so that's awesome. Uh, and I spend an awful lot of time on planes, and I'm getting to the point now where, so I flew yesterday, and my butt's actually still sore from sitting in coach yesterday. I'm going to blame old age on that one. So, what we're going to talk about today is when I was coming up from in the trenches to where I am now, and some would probably rightly say that I did jump a few steps, uh, right place at the right time. So, I made a lot of mistakes, and I did a lot of things really, really wrong when dealing with managers. Uh, some could say that it's because I'm an only child and I really like to get my way. Others might say that I'm just a jerk, and others might say that I'm just in security, so that's the way it goes. So what I wanted to do is give a presentation. Uh, I should also say that I've Recently, so I'm at, I have one more class to go towards a leadership and management certificate at Berkeley. Uh, and it's a lot of the things that I've learned there and have paid for, I think should be common knowledge for people in our industry without having to go pay for it. Because I'm cheap and now you can be too. So what I wanted to do is give a talk on how to work with management, how to communicate with management in a way that is going to resonate with them. Uh, it may feel dirty at first, but trust me, it, it gets better the more you practice. This is going really odd now. Okay, get that thought out of your head. It's really more around how to communicate in an effective way as opposed to just demanding something, not getting it, and then storming off, pouting, stomping your feet, and running away. So if you can't get what you want from your management team, uh, from your direct superior, from the executive branch, I'm hoping that at the end of this talk you'll have a couple ideas that you can walk away with that uh, can help you you know, twist that knife a little bit, but in a constructive way. So I'm going to go through a couple of things here. Sometimes they're thought of as uh, biased views towards the practitioners and the biased views towards the, the management tier, I'll say. Uh, and one thing is complaining. So we, as security practitioners, we love to complain and say that it's constructive criticism or it's the right way to do things because, you know, we are the people, we are the boots on the ground, we are the ones who are seeing everything as it burns to the ground. So we know what's going on. Therefore, we should be trusted when we come to management to say something. Does anyone disagree with that? Well, first, are there any managers in the room currently? Do you disagree with that? Yes, yes, no, sometimes, okay. 
practitioners are very close to the technology. Now, I'm not saying that we as practitioners, or you as practitioners, believe that technology is going to solve everything, but we work with technology on a daily basis, so we know what the capabilities are, we know what can't be done with technology, what has to be done with people, and we, we just understand that because we deal with it every day. Uh, when we think of objectives as security people, we think, all right, we are hired to protect the business and all the constituents from harm. We want to make sure that the business keeps running, and if it keeps running and is safe and secure, then we've earned our paycheck. Hopefully. If not, then you probably just don't want to be working where you're working. But that's the ideal view. So our measure of success is, you know, continuity, privacy. It's going to be achieved in a continuous fashion. So when we hear compliance audit and someone checks the box and you get like the nice little gold star that we've, you know, hey, we're PCI compliant, you're like, that doesn't matter. As a security person, it's like, no, not, not all that important. Because you know that minutes after that gold star goes up on the wall, that doesn't mean that there's an end in sight. There's no end goal. You haven't reached it. So there's still more stuff to do. Ideas, so we are very smart, we are very intelligent people, we like to communicate our ideas, sometimes not in the most effective way, uh, hence the talk, and negotiating. Because we see ourselves as the closest people to the technology, with the hands-on practical experience, we tend to think of ourselves as the authority when we discover something or when we report something, because we are the ones who are fiddling with the knobs and actually putting out the fires. Now the management view, it's not completely different, uh, but it's different enough to warrant different things to care or to consider and to really worry about. Um, complaining. So when you're a manager, one of the first things you do is learn how to, comp how to complain constructively. And this is either through like formal education, through workshops that when you're going through feel like the dumbest thing you've ever been through. I've been through a lot of them. They, oh, they're infuriating. Um, but you are communicating on behalf of the business and you are, your job is to make the troops understand. You're passing down the word from the top of the chain and you're trying to make them understand in a way that is constructive and not inflammatory. So technology, as a manager, you know, if technology goes away tomorrow, can you still do your job? Can you still produce the widgets? Maybe. Uh, in all likelihood, no. But that thought of, we just use technology to speed things up, to make things more accurate, to make our supply chain go faster. Uh, it's, it really is a means to an end. Now, in terms of objectives, Managers or leaders are brought on to, like I said, communicate the business priorities down to the, <laughs> walk the paper down to the engineers. Your really, your job is really to make the business succeed and make your people successful. So sometimes those seem at ends and that's, I would say that's the difference between a leader and a manager. Manager is pushing stuff from point A to point B a leader will inspire the people under them or in another team to want to move stuff from point A to point B. Job well done, everyone goes home, nobody gets hurt. Business keeps running. So it's not about putting the fastest, ne most next generation plus plus 2.0 whatever in place. It's making sure that the business is operational within the tolerance of the organization. And negotiating, it's not a my way or the highway kind of thing, or at least it shouldn't be. Again, differentiation between a manager and a leader. Uh, it should be a, when you're negotiating something from the management tier, you want to arrive at the most amicable decision for both the business and for the individual. And it's not always easy. Sometimes people just want to watch the world burn. 
so they'll be stubborn. So I, I love this picture by the way. I made this, patent pending. So people, when they think of how managers talk, think of someone fresh out of business school. What are some of the, the management BS bingo card words that come up or come to mind? Anyone want to chime in? ROI. ROI. Yeah. See, so yeah, that team player. <laughs> Synergies. Yeah. Shifting some paradigms outside of the box to collaborate more efficiencies. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Better yet, we're going to have a meeting to discuss the future meetings that we need. Drill down. Yeah. And. Does, does anyone just have like a guttural reaction to hearing these things? A lot of people do. Some people just kind of tune out. I'm at the point where, you know, it's just language. It's business language. They're going to use it. Although I still cringe at, uh, it is what it is. What, what, what is? What is it? Or at the end of the day? Oh, you mean like today? I love screwing with people like that. Like, you mean like today, today, or the end of which day specifically? So if you know, if your management, and typically you'll see this the higher up the food chain you go, there will be certain words that they are used to using with their peers. So if you can become a polyglot, speak, you know, normal human English, and speak some of the management tier I, I so don't want to say bullshit over and over again, but it's not. It's it's a higher level of language. So if you think of programming languages, who here knows assembly? One person, really? Well, see, that was kind of like, eh, at one point you knew assembly? I know 6800 assembly. So practical in this day and age. But I also, you know, I know Ruby and Python. Those are higher level scripting languages where assembly is a low level language. So they're not, they are different. Can they be used to do the same thing with a little work? Yes. Uh, but you can still get the job done, presumably, with either. Unless you hate Ruby and then you're just a jerk because sometimes I want to use Ruby instead of Python. So just think of it as a different communication style. So here are some of my favorites that I've heard along the way. Low-hanging fruit. A lot of words and whimsy to describe something that's easy. And it's true. Like, oh yeah, vulnerabilities. Well, let's get rid of all the low-hanging fruit, or let's prune the tree of low-hanging fruit first, and then we'll, then we'll what? Go apple picking in a bigger orchard? All right. FaceTime. So unless, like my mother, who says FaceTime meaning Skype, Google, whatever, like any sort of communication medium. Uh, FaceTime usually just means a face-to-face -face meeting, but clarify. Uh, let's take this conversation offline or touch base later. This is a very careful way of saying, I don't want to talk to you about this right now. It, it's much more polite. Let's take this offline or this, this may not be the time to discuss this. Let's, let's put a pin in this and circle back. Ah. Think outside the box. There are so many thoughts outside of the box in this day and age now because of this stupid phrase. Uh, but really, it's just think of a different way to do something. So living in San Francisco, I can walk a block and probably hear pivot about six times. It's really the best way to communicate that the first idea sucked, the second idea was kind of iffy, uh, so we changed our mind and we're going to do something else but it's made its way into the business dictionary as a proper term. Like, oh, we'll just, you know, if it doesn't work, we'll pivot. Or we'll pivot on this idea and do something else. Paradigm. It's just, it's, it's ubiquitous now. Uh, paradigm, it's just a model to get the point across. Most managers use it as a model to explain what a paradigm is. So it's a paradigm of paradigms. Deep dive, peel the onion. I hate the peel back the onion defense in depth methodology, blah, blah, blah. 
it's really just a detailed overview or a, a thorough examination of an issue. Feel free to print these off and put them in your cube or your office, by the way. Boil the ocean. Uh, if you work for a product company, especially one that does development, this will come up a lot, especially with product managers or product marketing folks, because they don't want to boil the ocean. They just want to succinctly deliver the synergies required in order to enable the business to succeed in their hockey stick growth. So, boil the ocean. Hey, let's not try and do absolutely everything. Let's just pick off some of the really good things to do. Is anyone playing Pokemon right now, by the way? Aw, sh should we go outside under a tree and have Pokemon talk? All right. So, move the needle. This is, we want to move the needle. We need to really disrupt things. And I should have put disrupt on there too. But move the needle. We want to make things better. Make it have an impact. End of the day, again, I already told you, and I probably threw up my mouth a little bit when I said it. Um, they don't mean the physical end of the work day, but it is still fun to screw with people if they say at the end of the day. Back burner, let's put it on the back burner. Meaning, again, polite way of, Let's not talk about this right now, because whatever I'm talking about is far more important than what you're bringing up right now. Ideate. Has anyone heard that used? This is one of the newer ones. You know, form an idea. Not, let's discuss an idea. It's like, we should ideate that problem. Really? All right. Pardon me? Confab. Obviate is another one. Uh, so as an analyst, I read a lot of these words, or as a former analyst, I've read a lot of these words in other people's reports, and I just kind of shudder, like, oh, the copy desk thinks you're a god because you use all these great words from business school. So obviate. You need to obviate the need for X. We'll remove it. Leverage. I'll be honest, I use leverage quite a bit because, you know, it's just enabling something. And it's, it's a lot smaller word than some of the other things that you could use. Uh, buy-in. We gotta get buy-in for this project. Well, no, you just, you just have to obviate the need for it. <laughs> See? So, those were the good words. You know, and I, I use the term loosely good. Uh, I'm gonna go over some of the bad words from a career limiting move standpoint. Uh, that I've gone through and I've experienced over the years. Never tell your boss that you can't or won't do something. It's, it's an emotional response and you're just, you know, you're shooting from the hip saying, no, can't do it. Overworked. No, I don't want to do that. That's stupid. That's dumb. It's, oh, I used, eh, good tie in. So, yeah, don't use them together either. So, if you are, if you can't do something, what you, and I'll show you how to communicate it a little bit better, uh, and really the optimal way I find that works, because it kind of twists the minds of the people that are get, trying to get you to do something. This, if you say can't or won't, you're immediately labeled as not a team player. And it's something that's very hard to shake. It's easy to get on the shit list, it's very hard to get off the shit list. And if anyone is sensitive about uh, language. I was in the Navy, and I'm not going to apologize for that. And my CEO swears like a sailor, so she's and she swears like a sailor. So they're stupid. Never say an idea or someone is stupid. We should go buy X vulnerability scanning software. That's stupid. We can just use open source tools. What a dumb idea. Again, an emotional response. It's not something that you should be saying because you're insulting the person. You may not, it might just be something that you're used to saying, like on Twitter, and just so you know, Twitter in real life, two different mediums. You can say, yeah, I know, weird, huh? Also, Pokemon, not real. <laughs> yeah. if, if you go and try and throw balls at a dog or something, one, you're gonna get punched in the face, and Two, it'll probably be me. So don't tell people their ideas are stupid. If you, the real master way of doing this is to convince them that your idea is the better idea. 
the PhD level way is convince them that your idea was their idea and is an awesome idea. So it makes them feel like they're geniuses. And you tell them so. So instead of telling them that their idea is stupid, you're telling them that their idea that they came up with, that you had the privilege of listening to, was the best idea you've ever heard. That's a good way to get back off of that list. So wrong, bad idea, wrong idea. Nobody likes being told that their thought was not the right way to do something. And it's just hardwired into us. So unless you are a complete introvert or a sociopath, this usually won't really phase you too much. If you are a complete sociopath, there's other problems in the business world. You're pro well, you're probably an executive, so in sales. So I wouldn't worry too much about that. One of the ones that I really want to communicate to you is if you're, if you've been asked to explain something, never start your sentence with, I feel or I believe, because that's, you know, another whimsical word that doesn't have a lot of, you know, there's no point to it. There's no impact. You're not really saying, Hi folks, I'm Geek here. Unfortunately, we had yet another problem with the Avimedias. I am looking into something else. And sorry for adding a little bit of extra commentary to Andrew's video, but he's sitting right next to me anyway, so he can put his own input in and what he thinks of Avimedia and uh, various video capture devices. Uh, can everybody say thanks, Avimedia? Thanks, thanks Avimedia. <laughs> anyway, video should resume again at the 27 minute 48 second mark. Sorry for the inconvenience.
It's not, just to let you know. <laughs> Spoiler alert, it's probably not that important. So do a cost-benefit assessment. Is what you're asking going to burn political capital that you want to use later? And should you be spending that capital? Or should you just hang on to it? You should also, you know, can you go and discuss this with your superior, with whomever you're trying to go to, and can you do it in an emotionless way? Can you communicate facts? Can you communicate really the raw data and the problem without going in there like an impetulant child? Most of the time, you can. So that's usually the stop point. Like, okay, I'm going to go take a walk, count to 10, whatever, and then I'll come back and I'll think, see if I can do it again. Consider the management point of view. This is probably the biggest challenge that we as practitioners and you as practitioners uh, will have because you are so, most of the times you are so far removed from the executive branch or the decision makers and you feel that you're just a cog. Well, you know what? A whole bunch of cogs need to turn in unison in certain ways in order for the business to operate. So you need to step back and say, okay, is what I'm asking for, what am I, what I'm demanding, is that something that's going to negatively or positively impact the business? Is it going to make me happy? Is it going to make all of my peers happy? Is it going to make our customers happy? And it's hard because if you, if you've never thought that way before, it's a very, it's an outward way of thinking of things because really it's, it's an insular kind of thing when you're sitting behind a keyboard at three in the morning trying to fix a firewall rule for some reason. So you think, oh, okay, well, if I get this firewall rule working, what's the business case? Well, uh, they don't have to pay me another hour or I don't have to take, I don't get vacation for another hour. I can go home and go to bed, see my wife and kids, play with my dog. You know, that's, that's not what is best for the business. Sorry, hang on here. There we go. And this is a big one. Decide what your boss should be doing. So, I'll let you in on a little secret. The higher up the food chain you go, even though it may not look like they are busy, but those people are extremely busy. So just like reporters, and I saw someone, I think Nick Selby put it on Twitter this morning, that uh, journalists are not miners, they're metal workers. They will build whatever you give them. And it's the same thing with management. If you give them ideas, they'll start constructing what the right course of action is. If you give them the course of action, hey, you've just saved them a whole bunch of time. So if you can try and figure out what you want your boss to do and then construct the paths and the argument to get them to do it, you're making their jobs easier because they don't have to make those decisions and they may look to you and say, okay, this person actually gets it. Or doesn't get it because it's a horrible idea, but you know what, think it through and take a chance. So build a business case. I learned this very early on. So. Does anyone work for a company that just flat out refuses to send them on training or to conferences that you think is, you know, that you personally think is good for you to grow? One person? Two people? One and a half people? Okay. So times have changed, apparently. So I, when I was at Q1 Labs, we didn't get to go anywhere unless it was local in the city because it's not something that the company wanted to invest in. So travel, training, you were hired to do a job. It was even worse in Bermuda because you were hired to do that specific job. And if you went above and beyond that job, there was actually a hotline that Bermudian locals could call to say, hey, this guy's going outside of his job requirements and you could have your work permit revoked and be deported. Good times, good times. Beautiful paradise not to work in. So what I learned is, when I was at Q1, was how to create a business case. And, and I'll go through the example in a little bit, but it helped communicate what I wanted to do and outlined all the costs associated with it. 
so that my manager could look at it and say, yep, yeah, that's in the budget, let's go. Or that's not in the budget, but it's discretionary, not a big deal. Focus on the facts. Again, this is where you're disconnecting from the emotions. You just want to say this is the factual information. And this will all come together in some examples, I promise. Look forward. Don't look backwards when you're going through this. If they said no, don't focus when you're coming back a second time that they focused and, sorry, that they said no the last time. Just focus on the optimal outcome. What's, what's going to come? What, how this is going to benefit you in the future and the company, et cetera, et cetera. Don't focus on the past or don't dwell on the past. And the last one is that if this is a group problem, and that arguably this could be further um, near the beginning, but if it's a group problem, take group action. So you don't go to the manager and say, hey, I think we should do this because I believe it's best for the group, and here's why. He said, you know what, we all got together. We decided that uh, out of the team of five, these are the areas that we need training in, and we believe that Bob and Suzanne should go. We don't feel we all need to go because they'll come back and they'll share that information so that we don't have to all go out of the office and cost the company a fortune. So wanting. My grandmother used to say, and I'm sure, I guarantee you someone in this room, their grandmother or grandfather said this at one point. So as an only child, I wanted a lot. You know, I wanted the new toy. I never got the G.I. Joe aircraft carrier. I still want that to this day because I never had it. I could never get it. It was too expensive. So my grandmother used to look me in the eye and say, Andrew, you can want in one hand and shit in the other and see which one fills first. And to this day, I still, I still think about that when someone says they want something because it's, it's true that, you know, you can say, I want something, I want something, I want something. Or you can just, you know, hey, Tangible, I've got that now. So you need to really differentiate between a need and a want. Do you need training or do you want training? Do you need to go to the conference? Do you want to go to the conference? Do you need a vulnerability scanning tool or do you just need to use what you already have? It's, it's hard to distance yourself from that decision because if you really believe that it's something you need, then it's hard to not convince yourself. So talk to some of your peers and say, hey, do we really need this? I think we need it. Do we think we need it? Or is this something that we would want to make our jobs easier? Come on. So here's a little flow diagram. Does anyone here not have a sim in this day and age? One person. The guy who doesn't get to go in training <laughs> should ask for sim training. So I need a sim to do my job. I need it. Absolutely need it. Um, regulatory compliance. This is usually a very good deciding factor. Does something mandate that I have to have this? Yes. Okay. Do we have anything that can't do this now? No, we have nothing. Or sorry. Uh, or sorry. Are you sure that you don't have a tool that already does this? Yes. Then you need a sim based on the compliance run. Do we have something that already does it? Oh, well, you just want a new sim. You want a new toy to make my job easier. So start thinking like this. And obviously, you don't have to create a flow chart for every decision you make. You'd never get anything done. Um, but just start thinking about it. You know, can I make do with what I have? And even in talking to management, you can say, you know what? I know we don't need a sim right now, but for the following reasons, we believe that this would help you meet some of the business objectives that you've lined out for this quarter. And then they think, oh, I do have objectives that I need to meet for this quarter. I'll get to that in a little bit. So negotiating. I'm going to zip through this because this could be an entire talk. Uh, has anyone ever taken any negotiating classes in business school? Or They are fun. And everyone uses the same business cases when they do negotiating. And most of them come from uh, Harvard Business School. And they just keep reusing them because they're really, really good. So you should only 
go into a negotiation when you don't have the power to bend someone to your will. So if, if I say to you, hey, I'm gonna, that laptop's mine now. You're gonna say, no, it's my laptop. So we negotiate. Say, I won't drag you out to the parking lot and beat you in <laughs> within an inch of your life if you give me the laptop. And I kind of know how that negotiation would end up, but I digress. So you need to actually follow steps in order to go through your negotiation. And this becomes very important when you are trying to bend your manager or your teammates to your, to what your idea is. So some things, there's two types of negotiations. There is distributive, where there's one winner, one loser. So I get a laptop, you don't get a beating. Some would argue that that is win-win. Actually, yeah, that would be integrative. Uh, I'm glad we're not doing reviews on this because threaten the audience. So distributive is really, you know what, I, I'm not going to negotiate with you so that we can come to you know, a common term where we're both happy and we hold hands and skip away off for a, off for a beer because we're both happy with the outcome. It is, I'm going to win, you're going to lose. And this is unfortunately what a lot of practitioners go to their management team with. This is the way it has to be. And they're like, no, that's not the way it has to be. Well, let me tell you the way it has to be. So there's going to be one winner, there's going to be one loser. Integrative is probably the most beneficial negotiation. So this is, so actually, you know what, a great example of distributive negotiation. Who here has recently negotiated a salary for themselves? And you've got a lot of problems. <laughs> yeah, so when you go and you say, okay, I, how much do you want? And you say, well, you know, I want what's fair. Oh, well, you know, we're willing, we're willing to offer 85,000 a year. Like, well, but I asked for 150 or 175,000 a year. Yeah, we're only doing 85,000. That's kind of a killer because can you negotiate? They're not willing to negotiate. So you have to either accept their 85, which a lot of people will do if they don't have a lot of options, or See if they'll throw in some additional things because they always have. There's always wiggle room. When they say 85, that is not their, that's not their, that's an anchor that they set. I'll talk about that in a minute here. Where integrative is where you go to, let's say Chinatown in New York City and you see a purse. I'm going to warn you, I don't do a lot of purse shopping so I can get this very wrong. And you go to the person and say, how much for the purse? And they say, $10. Okay, well, you know what? I, I think it's only worth two. Are you crazy? This is the best purse in the world. You know, you, eight. I give it to you for eight. Well, I saw this purse around the corner, actually at every single store. Um, four. I'll give you four for it. And then it's like, all right, you're killing me. You're killing me. Six. And then finally you finish at like 550 or something like that. They look upset, you look upset because it was so hard to get your price. But everyone walks away relatively happy. The store owner covered what their cost was, plus a little bit of profit, and you didn't have to pay the full value. That is an integrative negotiation. Whereas if you watch Pawn Stars, it's rarely ever integrative because they just try and screw everybody. So BATNA, best alternative to a negotiated agreement. If you do not have a BATNA going into any sort of negotiation, you're ill-prepared. So if you go, I'll just pick an example. Vulnerability scanner. We have to have a vulnerability scanner. Here is the use case. Uh, we need $250,000 in order to buy this for our capabilities. So if you go in, Knowing that 250 is the lowest that you need to actually get in and play, then you kind of screwed yourself on the anchor because, and I'll get the anchors in a moment here, 
it's either going to be a take it or leave it because you've put the price tag so low that if they say no, you've got nowhere to go. You can't just say, oh, you know, well, we can do it for 50. That's why anchoring becomes, actually, I'll skip Zopa. That's just a pain in the ass. Um, come on. So you know what? I don't think I talk about anchors here. I could have swore I had a slide that talked about anchors. So this is an anchor. This is an anchor. This is an anchor. This is an anchor. So when you are going into a negotiation, let's say for a salary, and you say, I want 200000 Oh, well, so this is, well, yeah, you're the buyer. I want $200,000. They'll say, well, you know what, we can only, we can only offer you 80 or a hundred thousand dollars. Okay. Well, what I really meant was I wanted 150. So you start negotiating. If you go above, so you set your anchor. This is, this is what you want. You would love to have this. This anchor is in your head, your walk away price. So if 85, is still above your walkaway price. Maybe you're, you know, this close to living on the street and you need a job, any job. You might say, okay, okay, I'll take the 85. But if your walkaway value is 90 and you know you can get a job somewhere else for 85, they offer you 85. Well, that's below your walkaway. You just say, nope, not going to do it. Sorry. Not interested. That's, that's far too low, but it's all based on your alternatives. And if you don't have alternatives, then you're, you're really handcuffed in the way you can negotiate these kind of things. So I'll, I'm sure you've all heard of the Scotty principle. If not, how much reset time till we can take her out again? Eight weeks, sir. But you don't have eight weeks, so I'll do it for you in two. Mr. Scott, have you always multiplied your repair estimates by a factor of four? Certainly, sir. How else can I keep my reputation as a miracle worker? Your reputation is secure, Scotty. So if you think about that from a negotiation point of view or a business need, business want, the anchor was eight weeks, but I'll do it for you in two. Meaning that Scotty could probably get it done in a week. But two, he's, you know, he's buffering out a little bit. Ordinarily, if it wasn't a dire situation, it would be eight weeks. He could take his time, he could do it right, et cetera, et cetera. And the same thing goes with any sort of negotiation you should be doing for product purchases, for training. This will make sense in a moment here. So you, in order to negotiate, you have to be prepared to walk away from the negotiation. Sometimes that's not easy to do or not possible. As such, that means that your best alternative is very weak. So you want a strong bat net. Best alternative to a negotiated agreement. And if you can quantify it even better, sometimes it's more of like a personal life choice or desire. That's hard to quantify. It's a little intangible. So now some examples. So we need to buy X tool product service. Has anyone gone to their management team and said, you know, we need this before? Yeah. And you got it right away, right? She's like, yeah, sure. Unlimited budget. Hey, let me shake the money tree. We'll get that. So this is a bad approach. You know, I need this vulnerability scanner to find vulnerabilities. Probably not, but all right. Better approach. We should look at evaluating this tools that may provide valuable information that may make the objectives outlined in your vulnerability management pro program more readily achievable. So again, we, we, meaning you and the boss and your coworkers, objectives outlined in your, or you could say our, vulnerability management program. If you say your vulnerability management program, you're saying, hey, I know this is important to you and it's one of your objectives. It's important to all of us, but it's specifically important to you. I want to help you make things better. If you say our, means that you have a vested interest that you're communicating to them that it's important for everyone. The better approach, I find, is that initial piece plus this bottom one. We can research this and see how it might improve our overall security posture 
and include a cost-benefit analysis to surface any savings that may result from its implementation. You're hitting them where it matters, in the wallet. Hey, we're going to spend some money on this, but I'm going to put together a spreadsheet that shows you how much we're going to save over time. And I guarantee you, if you go to the vendor and say, hey, I need this, they will have a canned one that they can just whip out. So most of your work's already done. You just need to cutesy it up a bit. I can't. I'm too busy. This actually happened to me uh, yesterday when I asked someone for help. I can't. I'm just too busy. So then my CEO messaged me and said, well, why can't this person do this? Like, they say they're busy. I know that they're working on something for one of the other executives. And the response was, no, no, he's not too busy. He can help with this. This is dumb. Go talk to, we'll make this happen. If he can't do it, we'll just get rid of him. I'm like, whoa, slow down. You know, it's, it's not that important. So if you say, I can't, I'm too busy, again, emotional response. Just, I'm really busy right now to even answer your question of whether or not I can help you with this. So based on the current workload and the availability of resources, we'll, so, eh, have to decide on what the priorities are. So collaborative, negotiation, integrative. We're going to work on figuring this out even better. So to put it back in the management sphere, have any of our tasks been reprioritized by the business? Are there any time constraints or pressing business needs that we need to account for? This is important. This will take your manager a moment to sit back and think, okay, well, is there anything more important? Yeah, we do have all this other more important stuff, so let's deprioritize this stuff that I just asked you to do, and we'll focus on this stuff. You're right. Good thinking. So I work my ass off, and I deserve training or whatever. This is for you in the burgundy shirt. Training, raise, and promotion. Let me guess, you haven't been promoted in a while either? No? Oh, all right. So you told yourself you could come? That, that's how it worked? Awesome. So we've been leveraging, yeah, keyword, current skills of the team, not just you, of the team, to complete our objectives, but there may be certain deficiencies we could eliminate through formalized training. So you're saying by learning something new and bringing it back into the organization, we can make the organization better. So the sum of all the parts means the whole is going to be that much better. Even better, so the good approach plus, here's a recommended list of formal training courses. Uh, that's a typo. A breakdown of associated expenses and a detailed summary of the ROI eh, as it maps to your 2016 security program objectives. So you're putting this in their lap saying, here are the things that we should do based on this list. Here's the return on investment based on what the vendor's telling me, what whomever's telling me, and why it's important, and how it's going to make the security program that you are in charge of that much better. So you should really work towards becoming a business language polyglot. It's not easy. Like I said, it does feel dirty at first. And it's not like you have to go start talking to your spouse about you know leveraging the meatloaf to to synergize the potatoes. It's not that doesn't happen. Pardon me. Uh, you can try. So has anyone ever heard of time boxing before? Like time boxing a conversation. So you're putting constraints on how long a conversation is going to go. I worked with a guy who learned this in agile training, and then he tried to constrain his wife's conversations about her day at work, we'll time box this. You have 15 minutes to tell me about your day. But after that, we're going to move on to something important. Did not go well for him at all. Not a good plan. So use business language like uh, cursing and swearing. There's a proper time and uh, sometimes a negative impact associated. When, if you look at that complaint methodology kind of chart that I built, go through that, obviously refine it for your problems, your issues, uh, and really your own style of how to communicate things. And make sure that if you have to negotiate, um, 
because you will have to negotiate with terrorists. That's just the way it is. You know, have to know your bet, your BATNA. <clears throat> Best alternative to a negotiated agreement. It, it just kind of rolls off the tongue after a while. And you need to know your BATNA because you want to make sure that you don't get less than what you're willing to accept. And it's, it takes practice. And honestly, if if uh, your local college, like community college, university college, whatever, if they offer a negotiating class, they're generally not going to be that expensive. Uh, I suggest taking it because if you want to, if you want to think of it a different way, you're learning how to social engineer management, which sounds a lot cooler than negotiating your batnet. You're trying to bend them to your will, and they will give you the tips and tricks on how to actually do that. It's great. You can really screw with people. How many minutes? 10 minutes? 40? All right. I, I tend to ignore the, just letting you know. Um, these are some books that if, you know, very, very quick reading, uh, negotiation. This is what they teach at Harvard Business School. So you can save yourself a boatload of money just by getting this book. It's only like about that thick, maybe 200 pages. Uh, influence by Geraldini, I think is how you say his name. Very good book. And Getting Past No, this is a really good book. If your boss says to you, no, we're not going to do that all the time, this will help you social engineer him to get that no into a maybe and eventually into a yes. So with that, and with only like 75 minutes left of time, um, does anyone have any questions? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> well, yes. So, so my last class in in my certificate program, it's predominantly focused on emotional intelligence, and I just kind of go, you know, it's very touchy-feely, it's not tangible, you know, I, I'm used to working with data, and analyzing things analytically, but to your point, yes, the methodology can be used in the same way, it's, if you think about it, most of these people that have written books and then have developed these methodologies, or paradigms, uh, we're probably all in class together at one point or another and have read each other's works. And they just say, hey, you know what? That's a cool idea. I'm going to give it a new name for this model and I'm going to change it up a little bit. You see that a lot with, uh, especially the emotional intelligence stuff. It's very similar. But yeah, you're, you're right. It's, it's similar. <laughs> You can, provided you are actually willing to walk away. So you can feign that you're going to walk away in the hopes that someone's going to come back and say, hey, you know what, uh, you were right, let's, let's come back to the table. That may not be the case. So if you, you have to be prepared to physically walk away and never go back. And sometimes that's not easy. At times it is a negotiating tactic. It happens in politics all the time. Uh, in the enterprise, though, it's a little bit harder because usually your walk away point is, I'm going to quit. And I'll be like, all right, see ya. Oh, no, 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 I didn't really mean that. I, I don't want to quit. I, I, I just wanted to talk about this more. They're like, no, you quit. <laughs> see ya. So you really have to be prepared to walk away. You got a log rolling? Yeah. All right. Okay, cool. So I'm going to be around the rest of the day and all day tomorrow. Uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to stop me. Uh, hope you enjoy this. A little bit heavy after lunch, but if you had Taco Bell, it really wasn't much. <laughs> it wasn't really food either, so yeah. All right, thank you.